we know in Genesis that God decided to create a woman because Adam needed a woman. This is the actual Hebrew word. It's ezer. Ezer means strong savior and rescuer. Does that sound like what you've been taught? I just want to make, like just sit with that for one moment. Is that the 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 woman counterpart that you've been led to believe God created for Adam? It's a bit of a different spin, yeah? So Azer is a combination of two root words, to rescue or to save and strength. I think I can get down with that. Can anyone else get down with that? That sounds accurate. So, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So in Hebrew, this make him a helper comparable to him is this word ezer. So it's not helper like, I'm going to make him a servant. Let's do that. Let's have a servant this way. Adam, you can get your laundry done. She can, you know, rub your back before you go to bed. That's not, that's not the context here at all. The context is like, bro, you are in need of a savior. Pause. I got you. I think also another word that's important, comparable. Once we start to dig into some of the translations as it moves through Greek and then finally into English, we start to see a lot of distortion happen, right? Because comparable is like showing like these are equal. You can compare one to the other. It's not like an apple to a pineapple. It's like two different types of apples. There's no levels, right? It's not, I'm going to prepare you somebody that can serve you at your feet, right? That's not what's happening here. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So this starts the test for Adam. When Adam has to name each of the animals, he's identifying them by how they present, right? He's not just coming up with random names like, hmm, I'm going to call you. Every single one of their names was based on their function. So he had to correctly experience their function and name them based on function. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up his flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. So this second highlighted part, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. This is his second test, right? So God actually like creates all these other animals and is like, here you go. You go out and name them, figure out what they are. And he eventually decides, like, there's no animal here that is anything like me. So he's still alone, correct? I know a lot of you are, like, you know, dog or cat lovers. I don't mean, you know what I mean. I'm going to clean that one up. But you, you love your animals. Great. 20, 2023, things got weird. I don't know, you got to got to clean that up. So the whole idea here is, right, Adam wasn't just looking for a companion, right? Because you can have companionship in an animal, right? You can have a dog that comforts you. You can have a dog that comes and sits by your feet when you're not feeling well. I know when I was giving birth to Sarai, my dog, Garuda, was leaning right by my head because I was having a home birth. And the whole time she was in the other side, right, because she was dead for 20 minutes. Hi, Sarai. Everyone waved us through. Eye. So we're glad you came back. So for 20 minutes, she was not alive. And my dog put his head right next to my head and was just kind of like, <laughs> for 20 minutes, out of nowhere, he jumps up and starts barking like crazy. And all of a sudden, Sarai's face turned pink and she came back to life. Okay? So he knew that her spirit had come back into the room. And all of a sudden, she took her first breath. And my dog was like, <laughs> <laughs> and ever, I was just kind of laying there like, this is not how I thought I was going to die. For real. Like, that was all I could think of during my birth was, I did not see this coming. I, like, really had imagined this, like, perfect, beautiful home birth. And now I'm about to die. My daughter's dead. I was like, really, God? Really? This is how it goes down. But obviously, God turned things around. My dog started barking. And look who we have now. An almost 13-year-old. So... All this to say, 
dogs can be wonderful. Dogs, hey, they can even see in the spirit. But was an animal comparable to Adam? No, he still knew. They have a function, right? They might even, like animals, see in the spirit. Hey, maybe even cats are partly in the spirit. I don't know. That's why they say they have nine lives. But he was clear that they were not his counterpart. So that was test number two. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Does this like one flesh, does this also indicate that there's some level? Or is one flesh one thing? One thing. So we've got two things that are very important. Number one, God was very selective in using this word azer to describe our function. We are not here to be servants, right? Submission is taken completely out of context in modern society. We are here to be strong, savior, rescuer of man. That feels more fitting, right? Does anyone feel like they just kind of vibe more with that sort of... So let's go deeper. Azer is also used throughout the Bible in three different contexts. The primary context of Azer is used in a military context. It's also used to describe God's proverbial help. So now we're adding on, right? So savior, rescuer, but also in a military context. Then on top of that, it's also how God steps in to offer help. I'm not saying we're God's gift, but are we? So Ephesians 6.12 is important for us to understand that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we are in a spiritual war. This describes it very clearly. Women are the tactical advantage. I'm just going to, let's just say it, sit with it for a second. Women are the tactical advantage. God knew that man needed its counterpart. We have a very specific function in a spiritual battle. We are the counterpart that makes partnership so. You can't be in partnership with one person, right? Partnership is a key strategy of spiritual war. You have to be in fellowship, right? If you're trying to fight spiritual battles on your own, how does that go for you? Is that fun? What happens when all of a sudden you get around other women of God? Do things change rapidly? Okay, what happens when your husband is truly walking with the Lord and you pray with your husband? Right? That's, I mean, that's like a, it's a different level. Now, I think it's important for us to remember that not all of our male counterparts are there yet. Yeah? Okay. There's a reason for that, and you serve a very important function to help them with that. So I think let's go with this idea, right? In the Christian community, there's this very strong idea that you have to be equally yoked with your partner. I believe that this is true, but I also believe that you can be equally yoked and have that in the physical not quite look very equal, okay? Women serve a function where we are actually able to draw out and nurture and support that part of our husband before it's really manifest in the three-dimensional space, yeah? Men, I believe, in this world are way more subject to attack than women especially so in the last few years. Men are getting it from all angles. And if you look at even the AI or transhumanist agenda, they are major targets, right? The culture of our time wants men to be completely broken, addicted to porn, not able to fully commit into a relationship, not really know who they are, to only seek money, fame, status. This is the time that we have to know our function. When the enemy wants to attack and destroy our identity as women, the only way to stand in opposition to that is to actually know who and what you are and what your function is. Because then it becomes very clear 
what is or isn't, right? Go back to where Adam had to name things by their function. 